In this section of thermochemistry, we're going to talk about systems, surroundings, specific heat, and the heat formula. So let's get started. So the first thing you need to know is that there's three types of systems out there. The one on the left is what we call an open system, where heat can flow in and out of the system, but also the chemicals can flow in and out. You can imagine if I had gas being produced, it could just escape right into the atmosphere. If you look at the second type, it's called a closed system. And heat can go in and out of that flask, but the chemicals are basically they're stuck inside that flask. The third type is called an isolated system. Now there's no perfect real isolated system, but a thermos is as close as we can get. Um, if I put hot scalding water into that thermos, uh, the gases that are produced in there, like perhaps steam, uh, would be trapped inside that environment, but also the outside of the thermos would not feel hot, so it's keeping most of the heat inside as well. So that's something to keep in mind. Now when we talk about systems and surroundings of um, chemical reactions and um, thermochemistry, we want to make sure that we know what we're talking about in terms of the system and the surroundings. So the system is essentially the chemicals involved in the, in the chemical reaction. Um, that means that uh, you know if you have sodium chloride reacting with calcium carbonate, those two things are your system, not the water they're in, not the environment, not the air, uh, just the chemicals that are involved. The surroundings are anything uh, other than those chemicals. For example, uh, you might have your chemicals be in solution. Well, the water that you dissolve them in could be the surroundings uh, versus the chemicals that are dissolved in them. Um, also, the air inside the flask, the air just outside the flask, anything like that, that's your surroundings. Well, now, when you take the amount of heat in your system and the amount of heat in your surroundings and you add them together, you have the total heat of the universe. And the first law of thermodynamics tells us that uh, energy is conserved throughout the universe. So you can imagine if a system loses heat, those surroundings are going to gain that exact amount of heat. Something to keep in mind for the future. So here's an example of a uh, chemical reaction that we have here. Um, and I want to talk about quickly how there is a system and a surrounding inside this environment. So it's calcium chloride reacting with sodium sulfate uh, producing sodium chloride and calcium sulfate. Notice they're all aqueous, which means they're in solution. So those chemicals have a certain amount of potential energy in their bonds, which can lead to the release of energy or the needing of energy to provide for them. Um, and that energy that we have in there is called the system. So this system inside here is just the chemicals involved in the chemical reaction, just like we showed in the previous slide. The surroundings in this case would happen to be the water in solution, um, so you can imagine if those chemicals released a certain amount of heat, that water would actually start to heat up. Um, also, the air around the flask um, or inside the flask, if there's any air inside there, that would also be the surroundings. And finally, the glass of the flask can also gain heat or have to give off heat as well to provide for that chemical reaction to occur. Um, so all of those things are the surroundings. And if we take the heat lost uh, from the system and the heat gained by the surroundings, they should uh, essentially make the, the universe amount of heat or energy uh, generally the same as it was before the reaction. Basically, there's two main types of reactions when it comes to thermochemistry. One is called endothermic and one is called exothermic. Exothermic means exit. So on your left side, you see that heat is escaping the system, um, which means that's an exothermic reaction. And on the right side, heat is going into the system which is why we call it an endothermic reaction. Just a couple of terms for you to know there. Here's an example of a, an exothermic reaction. Um, notice how we write the chemical equation and we put heat as one of the products because it is given off. And over here on the right, we see a reaction of an endothermic reaction where we put heat as a reactant uh, because it is needed for the reaction to occur. If I were to uh, graphically represent an exothermic reaction, it would look something like this, where my products have less potential energy than my reactants. So if my reactants had more energy and now my products have less energy um, at the end, then that energy has to be given off somewhere. And that energy given off is what we call an, an exothermic reaction. If we look at the opposite of that, 
the reactants here have less energy than their products so we need to gain energy in order to form those products so the gaining of energy is considered an endothermic reaction all right so here are some terms uh, dealing with heat uh, and so you understand what heat is a lot of people think heat and temperature are the same uh, but they're not heat is uh, represented by lowercase q and it's the transfer of thermal energy from one system to another which could be the surroundings now uh, the SI unit for heat is the joule. Um, you've seen that before, and it's just abbreviated with a capital J. Uh, and what a joule normally was is it was usually used for uh, physics, um, which is uh, you might remember from physical science as uh, work, force times distance. So a joule is essentially the amount of energy needed to move one kilogram the distance of one meter. That didn't have much use for chemists, uh, so before they started using the joule, they used something called the calorie. Uh, the calorie is the amount of energy to raise one gram of water up one degree Celsius. So if I needed to raise two grams of water one degree Celsius, then I would need two calories. Um, that's kind of the way that works. Um, of course, there is a conversion. One calorie is equal to 4.184 joules. So that's something that we'll deal with here in just a second in a calculation, uh, just to show you how that works. But I want to point out one other thing for you. Um, you might have seen on your uh, bag of chips or anything like that, you might have seen calories. But if you look at this calorie, notice it's a lowercase c. This is what we call a scientific calorie. Um, what you see on the chips have a capital calorie, and that's called a nutritionist calorie. Well, one nutritionist calorie with a capital C is equal to 1,000 scientific calories with a lowercase c. That's also known as one kilocalorie. Um, so when you see a bag of chips and it has a uh, big C for calorie, that's a nutritionist calorie, which is actually one kilocalorie in scientific calories. So let's look at an example here. Um, we have a delicious bag of Doritos over here. Uh, if you look at the nutrition facts, you'll see that it contains 140 calories. You'll also see that calories is capitalized. So that's 140 nutritionist calories. So let's go through a calculation to see what is the amount of potential energy in this uh, serving size of Doritos um, in joules. So what we got to start off with first is that we know there's 140 nutritionist calories in this serving. Well, we need to get that into um, scientific calories first. So we multiply by a thousand there, and you'll notice the nutritionist calories cancel out. And our next step, of course, is to get those calories into joules. And we know that there's 4.184 joules in one scientific calorie. So you can see all we do is take 140 times 1,000 times 4.184, and you get your answer of 586,000 joules. Our next term is called specific heat. And it's essentially the amount of heat necessary to raise one gram of the substance, one degree Celsius. Um, we talked about water where uh, a joule was 4.184 calories. That's kind of the same thing, but everything's got its own specific heat. And if we look at this chart here, you'll see that all these different substances have different specific heats. Now, the higher the number or the higher the specific heat, the harder it is to change its temperature, the more heat we need to change its temperature. So if you look at water at 4.184, that's much higher than all the others. Uh, gold has the lowest specific heat, which means it is the easiest to change its temperature. With just a little bit of heat, it'll change its temperature very quickly. So we can use specific heat and our heat formula to calculate many different things. Um, what we see here is uh, Q, which is heat, is equal to M, which is mass, times the specific heat, represented by the letter C, times delta T, which is our change in temperature. Now, most of the time when we deal with heat, it is an absolute value. It's always gonna be a positive number, but we just need to talk about whether the heat was gained or lost in this situation. So let's see what we got here. Imagine a 25 gram aluminum ball at room temperature, which is about 20 degrees, is placed in some boiling water at 100 degrees. What would be the amount of heat gained by the aluminum ball in joules? Now, in order to do this, we need to know the specific heat. So the specific heat of aluminum is 0 0.900 joules per gram dot degrees Celsius, okay? So let's see what we're trying to do. We're trying to find out with the amount of heat, which is our Q. So essentially, we need to take the mass times the specific heat times the change in temperature. Well, if we write this out, we end up having 25.0 grams. There's our specific heat of 0 0.900. And then, of course, the temperature change went from 20 degrees Celsius to 100 degrees Celsius. Um, we're assuming that aluminum ball was going to be 100 degrees Celsius at the end. 
So it must have gained 1,800 joules of heat. So we would say there are 1,800 joules of heat gained in that situation. We can also use the specific heat and this heat formula to calculate the amount of mass of something. Of course, we can calculate anything from this formula as long as we're giving, given enough of the variables. So let's look. 432 joules of energy is required to raise the temperature of a block of aluminum from 20 degrees Celsius to 60 degrees Celsius. And what we want to do is we want to calculate the mass of the aluminum present. So they give us the heat of 432 joules. They give us the specific heat of 0 0.900 joules per gram dot degrees Celsius. And our change in temperature is obviously 40 going from 20 to 60 degrees. So if we set this up, we end up having our heat formula. Um, set up just like that, and we're just going to use algebra to solve for M, which is our mass, which if you look at the units of the specific heat, our mass has to be in grams. So let's go ahead and solve for that, and you get 12.0 grams. So make sure you can put that in your calculator and get the right answer and see what you got.